Hello everybody, I am your host Akriti Anand and once again I welcome you all back to the largest and the biggest entrepreneurial event happening at present, the Thai Global Summit 2020. After the concentration on leveraging the board for your success, let's now shift focus to private equity investments in India. Ever wondered what goes inside the mind of a private equity investor? How has 2020, the pandemic, affected the private equity investments? The private equity investments. Well, our next panel is here to discuss about all this and give you the answers probably. On the panel, we have Mr. Shantanu Rastogi. Shantanu Rastogi is a managing director and focuses on investments in the firm's financial services, healthcare and consumer sector in India and Asia Pacific region. He joined General Atlantic in 2013 after working at the firm for two th from 2005 to 2007. Previously, Mr. Shantanu was a principal at Apex Partners and prior to that, he was a management consultant at McKinsey and Company. Moderating this session, we have another stall ball from the industry, uh, Mr. Rajiv Memani. He is the chairman and regional managing partner at EY India he is also a member of EY's Global Executive Board and Chairman at EY's Global Emerging Markets Committee. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks a lot, Akriti. Thank you very much. Is our voice clear? Yes, it is. That's great. That's great. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Thanks Akriti. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Rajiv. Yeah, good afternoon, Chantanu. So let's, let's kick it off. I think we have about half an hour. Mm -hmm. So let me, just before I... Uh, uh, start this session and ask some questions. Just a very quick overview of what's happening uh, in the private equity space uh, in India, just in terms of some data and numbers to set the context uh, for the audience. Uh, the uh, In India, roughly, if I look at private equity 2017, uh, the total investment in private equity was about off uh, in India was about $13 billion across all asset classes. Uh, in 2018, that was close to 25, 26 billion. In 2019, that was between about 43, 44 billion. And this year also, it's estimated to be almost 40, 45 billion dollars. So this is across all sectors: so financial services, technology, real estate, infrastructure, pharmaceutical, healthcare, uh, and most importantly, in the startup space. I think it's been a very, very significant source of giving impetus to the to the startup sector uh, in India. And, uh, you know, if I look at just from an IPO standpoint, uh, if I look at last three years, the money raised through I private equity is almost three times uh, what has been raised through capital markets. And last year, almost 80% of foreign direct investment in India uh, was through private equity. So that just explains the importance of this asset class, uh, both from its share of foreign capital, the support it's providing to entrepreneurship, uh, uh, by, you know, just by providing a very, very active source uh, of capital and the economic relevance uh, for a growth market, emerging market like India. Uh, and Shantanu, who, uh, as Akriti said, is the managing director for uh, uh, General Atlantic. And General Atlantic has been in India for a long time, uh, invested, you know, over $5 billion, I think, in India, Shantanu. And I think uh, in the last three, four years, almost 3 to $4 billion. So, very significant investors in some great companies like Unacademy, Baiju's, Geo Platforms, Reliance Retail, uh, uh, the uh, No Broker. So I've been out some excellent, uh, uh, you know, uh, plethora of investments. I'm just naming a few, Shantanu. I know there are a whole lot. Uh, and before I, uh, before we deep dive into all the questions, maybe a good, good to get your perspective because you know when COVID happened. Uh, people stalled for a bit, uh, private equity investors in terms of investing. But when I talk to, uh, you know, private equity investors in India, when I talk to some of them globally, uh, you know, it's it's back in full flow. For many, this has been one of the most remarkable years. But definitely the mindset in terms of the way you evaluate future investment opportunities would have, would have, would have changed a bit. So just, you know, it'll be great uh, if you can share your perspective on how private equity investments would be in post covid area what are some of post covid era what what are some of the changes uh, that you see will happen sure um, rajiv happy to um so 
you know there are changes on on many different aspects um let me first talk about one generic change through all crises be it the 2000 uh, you know y2k crisis or the 2008 uh, global financial crisis or the covid crisis this time around you know what comes out is that the most agile management teams the most resilient business models always come out stronger post these crises uh, so companies uh, which did not have resilient business models did not have strong balance sheets not agile you know management teams end up losing market share and sometimes end up you know completing a sort of completely losing their business uh, during such crises so one uh, such crises are always good tests of the quality of the management teams that are running your businesses and the quality of the business models so i think one a uh, great uh, outcome of uh, such crises is to really assess uh, the quality of the business model and the team that you have invested in and it's a great report card to know if there is change required in any of your portfolio companies i think the second big uh, a change which is probably a uh, visible all across is that companies which were late to adopting digital as a part of their workflows as a part of their consumer engagement uh, as a part of their processes uh found it very very hard to be resilient and to gain share or manage costs during these uh, during this crisis and that again uh, you know is a big call of action to all boards to all management teams to all ceos uh that digital is the way to go and if they haven't invested yet then now is the time to do it so a big change in private equity is going to be to look at the digital readiness of the companies and to see if there's a lot of alignment with the management team are to have operating models uh, workflows you know consumer engagement um, uh, models which are really digital ready and sometimes i would even argue digital first so that's uh, you know the probably the second uh, big change the third is you know some sectors might be hurt uh, for a pretty long time uh, i think um, for example office spaces um, you know travel uh rajiv uh, we always talk about you know how much travel you or me would be doing before this and you know when things become completely normal i think a lot of us there's a permanent behavior change in terms of what we are comfortable doing online now yeah uh, visa we having to be you know do face and face so some sectors would would see permanent impairment I, i think that's the other sort of third dimension on which investing not only private equity but otherwise would change that's great chantru yeah i was talking in terms of office space though still a lot of investment going on you know by funds like brookfield and blackstone That's but on travel i was just talking you know when we look at from an ey standpoint look at it we look at our travel costs in 2019 1920 because april to march mm-hmm. uh, and then we looked at our travel costs from 20 to 21 uh, which are likely to be much lower and when we plan when as we are planning for 21 22 we don't want go to go back to 1920 we want it to be somewhere in in between and also this entire concept of sustain sustainability is becoming very important and travel is one of this unfortunately is not uh, carbon friendly so you're absolutely right i think those are some of industries which i think will uh, will get impacted shantu just carrying that same thread forward uh, when we look at uh, you know as we looked at covid for a lot of entrepreneurs uh, unit economics part to profitability is one aspect that they look at and then hyper growth market grab at any cost is the other aspect that they look at as you evaluate companies or when you look at investments or as you strategize for your companies does that change in a post covid world and what would be your advice to entrepreneurs sure uh, that's a great uh, question rajiv <coughs> and i think uh, i would say in most business models the importance of unit economics far outweighs the importance of market share okay and that's because unit economics tells you a very important factor about your business model which is is there a product market fit are you having to invest a lot in changing a consumer habit or in selling your proposition because its natural advantage is not significant hmm. so to me unit economics is a great feedback from back from the market that the proposition or the product you have developed is it compelling enough is it meaningful enough for people to shift from whatever they are doing or the incumbent model that they are using today yeah. uh, so unit economics in most cases in my view far outweighs the importance of market share however there are certain business models which lend themselves to network effects mm. wherein if you have 
one sided or two sided networks and one one of the examples of that are marketplaces wherein you know the original marketplace was ebay but now even amazon or alibaba uh, taobao are marketplaces in these in such marketplaces uh, much like let's say financial exchanges like like the national stock exchange liquidity or the depth of supply and depth of demand at all points of time developing is far more important uh, at a good harmonious pace and in these kind of business models the size of the price is so big that in the early years of the business model it's okay to ignore unit economics uh, because the price of developing liquidity on the supply side and the demand side is much much bigger and the exit barriers for the customer are very high which means the entry barriers for any new competition is very high so i yeah. would say it's a more nuanced answer but yeah. the generic takeaway i would say is that unit economics is the more important in my view vis a vis uh, vis a vis market share right 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 yeah so the um... on the uh, on you know as a lot of uh, entrepreneurs right now uh, i think who are in the audience uh, would have either raised venture capital now looking at private equity or angel investing or uh, are probably you know looking at fundraising for the first time uh, you know as a private equity investor how do you evaluate investment decisions you know what 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 are the top few things that you look at uh when someone is coming and pitching for an investment sure uh, rajiv so i'm going to talk about sort of two vantage points one vantage point more as a late stage growth investor yes as general atlantic and the second one more as a smaller fund doing early stage growth in uh, venture investing so from our vantage point you know the investment thesis the most important thing is to understand uh, a couple of things one being the total addressable market are you addressing an opportunity where the total market size that you are going after is actually large enough uh the second is do you have a product market fit and product market fit is not just about price and your proposition but also about the cost of selling and that goes back to your earlier question on unit economics mm-hmm. uh so to be able to service or sell the product eventually post selling costs and con- or contribution are you able uh, to justify and is the customer willing to really pay the price uh, to make your uh, you know business model viable uh, the third i would say is the quality of the team is the team uh, you know agile um, is it a learning team uh, is it a team that's nimble is it a team which has the capacity and understanding of technology these are the certain sort of areas on which we evaluate the quality of the team um and the last one is that you know for a late stage fund like us we focus a lot on saying what's going to be the eventual outcome in 5 to 10 years is this company going to be large enough such that it can go public or is it going to be interesting enough for a for a indian or a global uh, company to acquire so these are some of the aspects on which we focus however there are companies where one of the first criteria i spoke about which is total addressable market could be relaxed and the way to uh, sometimes venture capital firms or tech venture corporate venture capital firms focus on such companies because sometimes if you develop interesting tools which themselves may not be addressable you know addressing large market sizes but could be very important in improving the productivity or improving the technology of large companies and then those you know companies become interesting acquirers you know this is a big trend in the us where cisco microsoft uh, yahoo uh google uh, have been great acquirers of smaller technology businesses uh so that's the second way of looking at uh, businesses where total addressable market is not an important criteria this is great yeah so size of market quality of management team unit economics exit criteria and obviously depending on who the investor is you know size of market could have some strategic angles to it so that's great chance that's a Uh, i think uh, great template for people who are looking at raising capital you know often uh, shantanu when we have gone and you know, when we are raising capital for companies uh, you know when you talk to private equity and i have seen actually how private equity in many cases uh, has added a lot of value uh, to companies in some cases they haven't so what in your view as you have looked at uh, you know as an investor where have you added maximum value 
to the investee company so if someone is looking at raising capital what should he look forward to receiving from uh, a private equity fund apart from capital of course got it and that's a tough question rajiv because depending on the stage of the company and uh, its history what the company really needs in terms of value add is often different yeah and as we develop our thesis we always think about are we really backing the current entrepreneur or are we buying into an asset wherein we will require a professional management team but that's more late stage investing why don't i make my answer more relevant for perhaps younger companies or entrepreneurs sitting in the audience today right so i think for the companies which are younger and which are focused on you know largely on technology businesses or technology enabled businesses um i think what they ought to look for in the investor in terms of value add is good knowledge of you know business models ability to be able to help them hire good talent uh from the market and build capacity in their team to execute their ability to be able to introduce customers uh with which who necessarily may not always give them contracts but could allow their databases or could their companies to be good experimentation grounds for product market fits or for testing a new technology or a new product uh, you know these are some of the aspects that come immediately to mind for younger companies obviously in somewhat larger companies being able to build the financial processes uh properly giving them access to you know capital markets by having more mature firms come and invest in them at the right stage are also areas in which you know, private equity firms can add value uh yeah. but i i think uh, you know talent customer introductions um uh, would for younger companies perhaps in my view would be would be the top areas of value add yeah yeah absolutely shantanu that's what i've seen and in many cases i've also seen just being a sounding board for the entrepreneur uh, and you know just getting him through some of the key uh, management decisions or in, in fact just looking at the mis and saying okay you know how's the working capital behaving you know what's the cash you know uh, collection how is that going so so basic things you know how do you accelerate the rocs and others uh, to you know doing more fundamental thing uh, basic you know processes and everything and doing more fundamental is really team and strategy and uh you know understanding uh, you know what's happening externally and bring that into the organization so i think the most important is to be the partner to the founder and his team and someone who can objectively uh build a strong relationship to objectively analyze what they are doing and you know be their partner in that journey and that's that's, that's a great that. point rajiv i can't agree more i think partnership with the founders and letting empowering them to make the ability of making sound uh but quick decisions yeah and allowing them to feel okay if 20% of their decisions are wrong yeah uh, le- letting them live with their failure you know is also a very important aspect of a good partner yeah and the second point you made is also a very impor- important one which is at some later stage of the business the difference between good and great businesses is all about how they allocate capital and how they allocate their resources right uh, so once you have got into that stage of a company uh having a private equity investor which can help you make better decisions on capital allocation resource allocation is absolutely critical so i think both your points are very yeah. very uh, relevant and very important yeah yeah no thanks shantanu so you know as you you know putting you if you were to put yourself in the shoes of an entrepreneur and you know suppose you have a few choices to make uh you know f- you know to whom to uh, you know accept uh you know capital from a lot of times obviously it's driven by valuation you know so is offering a high value but apart from that are there other things to look at uh, uh you know apart from valuation uh when you are looking at evaluating you know who you are going to and who you should be raising capital from uh that's again a great um, uh question uh, ajeev i think if you ask me valuation should be among the top 5 but definitely not the top criteria right the reason in early stage of financing the difference between x and 2x value the dilution difference is not more than 5 to 10% you know for the founder right but every founder needs to ask them do they want to own you know 30% of a 100 million dollar company or they would rather own you know 20% of a 5 billion dollar company and the answer is you know very simple so 
I think the due diligence that entrepreneurs need to do on their partners or investment partners is as important as the one that's done by investors, which is the person who's going to be joining my board, the person who's going to whose skin in the game is you know as important for my success, you know as my company success is. Uh, that person, what is their experience? What are the companies that they have added value to? Hmm. The ways in which they are able to add value, be it their network, be it their strategic thinking. What are the reference checks that I can do about problems you know that other entrepreneurs have faced and how have they helped? Uh, so I believe you know really assessing the true value add of a potential partner is very very important. Should be a very important selection criteria. And all entrepreneurs know the key issues they are facing or the key challenges they are facing, and they must do reference checks with other companies the individual and the firm have funded, and figure out if the match is the right match or not. Yeah. Uh, after that, I believe eventually the valuation differences or fair value differences are not more than 10, 20 percent, and hence that should be one of the top five, but not the most important. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I I completely agree. Although it's it generally boils down to valuation, I've seen, but. Uh, I think uh, a more holistic assessment uh, is very, very important. And I think trust, you know, Ansi, going back to the earlier point also, trust is a very, very important criteria, you know, uh, you know, how you build trust and rapport. Because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, objectives have to be aligned. You have to work with that person and how he adds value, how, do, how there's mutual trust that's built in. I think that becomes very critical for uh, success uh, going forward. And also peace of mind and being very focused on the business. And, and growth from both sides. Totally if, if both of you are trying to second guess each other, then I think it's the journey is not fun. Can't and somewhere, somewhere, somewhere yes. compromises value. I totally agree with you, Rajiv. As I reflect upon what you said, I think the biggest benefit of a due diligence process, hmm. the quality of time you get with each other to discuss issues. Right. And to discuss potential solutions, how to resolve them. Because that's when you really get to know each other well personally. Absolutely. And could you be trusted partners? So I think the point you made is is a very very important one, a very relevant one. Yeah. So uh, uh, Shantanu, do you have you are you? I mean, I have seen some cases now, or quite a few. And are you seeing this as a? What's your view as you look at these this analysis? It's a very micro question. Uh, you know, I, a lot of uh, in the technology space largely and also to some extent in the pharmaceutical healthcare space and services space we are seeing uh, uh, private equity investors uh, from india or global funds or, or india only funds who are looking at investing uh, in the us company which has got the us market and us <coughs> and but a back end uh, in india and doing a roll up or doing uh, you know, especially in the digital space, you know, expanding rapidly, but leveraging India for a competitive advantage in terms of cost, in terms of innovation, in terms of speed, uh, but having the market access outside. Uh, do, you, do you see that trend growing? Do, do you, have you invested in any of these kind of companies? Or? Um, well, Mu Sigma was one of our investments like that. Uh, right. And uh, in fact, even before that, Genpac, uh, you know, Hexaware, Putney Computers, the more traditionally old sort of old traditional IT services businesses were, yeah. but the early avatars of the business yeah. model that you just spoke about. The difference is that in that avatar, companies were selling skills on the time and material basis, you know, largely time of people um, and capabilities. I think the new age companies are taking products and customizing those products and services for customers in the US. I think it's a very, very relevant uh, business model coming out of India because uh, the quality of technology talent, application development talent, product development talent in India is one of the best in the world. And uh, uh, our, under our English speaking skills, our knowledge of the US market, cultural similarities in many ways for many, many you know, cities or states which have had a lot of people you know, go to the US. Uh, these all these uh, characteristics give us a natural advantage to have business models such as this. So I think some great companies like iCertis um, and many others are actually doing this, where they have delivery centers back here in Hyderabad, Pune, or Bangalore, and the sales team or the solutioning team often sits, uh, you know, in the U.S. Um, uh, uh, we are looking for more and more business models like this, 
and right. we believe that they will be hugely successful globally yeah yeah no i think the uh, relevance of india in that is increasing i mean even if i look at uh, uh, you know consulting firms like ours today our largest pool of talent would sit in india i mean today we'll have uh, you know somewhere between 50000 to 60000 people in india not serving the india market but serving uh, global markets uh, from india and it's not that we are outliers i think there are quite a few you know who are who are doing that so you're absolutely right i think it's a great recognition of the speed scale and cost uh, you know at which you can do innovation or some of these things i mean all these three things come into play and uh, very few other geographies can you know bring that kind of all three together speed and scale and cost um, uh, in, fact, they, in fact ey might be one of the one of the top 5 or top 10 already out of this uh, you know yes. initiative so yeah no i think that's it's it's really it's really growing quite a bit Uh, last question chantanu is this uh, you know how is esg playing out i mean is this uh, you know i you know i'm we are increasingly at least as a consulting firm we are at least increasingly seeing companies focus more on that uh, when we look at pools of capital allocation that are happening with uh, lps and others they are talking more and more about esg and you know uh, companies focus on that or business models that are focused on that how do how do you when you are looking at investments or uh, how do you look at it or, sure rajiv i think esg is a has been core to building businesses for the best entrepreneurs always yeah and even when this term was not coined you know i think good governance is something which is a in india or actually anywhere else in the world is a bare minimum requirement that any institutional investor be it private equity or the capital markets or even the bond markets would look for right when they are when they are going in uh sustainability uh is a very very large very very important risk management criteria and all entrepreneurs have thought through you know changes in how energy consumption would change and you know i think most of the time thinking about esg has, has been about risk mitigation cutting cost improving efficiency mm-hmm. um now it also helps to sell better because, yeah you know customers care uh, a lot about it yeah environment is certainly an angle that entrepreneurs themselves and board themselves are paying a lot of attention to yeah. I mean, for general atlantic these are very very important uh, criteria yeah as a global institutional investor who's managing you know such a humongous pool of capital for us assessing the business not only on these parameters but understanding the mind of the entrepreneur hmm. the values of the entrepreneur um, you know aligned with you know good esg practices uh, is is very critical and and we we believe you know this is good business this is shareholder value creating um uh, you know in in pretty much all the cases uh, so good entrepreneurs uh, would do well to really think about these aspects on their business and make sure they are you know uh, you know 10 on 10 on these just like they are on product market fit and new economics yeah absolutely there is one question from the audience uh, how india stack has been used by private entrepreneurs to build digital systems around public services So Shantanu I don't know if you if you've looked at this of course uh, Rajiv I think uh, India stack is I mean if you look at our investment in geo platforms huh. the way the way they could uh, uh, you know grow uh, to this kind of subscriber base uh, with minimal you know customer acquisition costs was actually because of the benefit of the India stack yeah the aadhar based digital ekyc was critical for them so I think most smart nimble entrepreneurs and companies are using the india stack very very efficiently very smartly uh, and the ones that are not uh, sooner or later you know would have a would have a big issue so yeah uh, it's being used by everyone yeah i agree i completely agree with you and uh, so uh, you know as we uh, are looking at or building these uh, applications or platforms for some of our clients we are leveraging the india stack you know especially for those which are uh using uh, the india market so whether even including for digital lending uh for you know doing any form of kyc for payments for bank transfers uh and i think it's very efficient and given that it's an open system uh, of, uh open architecture i think the cost also at which one can build some of the stuff is also very one very quick and again also very very cost effective 
Can't agree more, Rajiv. In fact, I think it's going to be one of the biggest, the biggest sort of competitive advantage process or standards exports out of India. India, absolutely. Because this kind of a stack at this scale has probably yeah. never been built before, built before in any uh, you know country. So absolutely, uh, be a huge advantage for us and a big export. Absolutely, and you know, available to everyone. So not headed by one company, but just available for free access to everyone. I think that's a great part of that. Thanks a lot, Shantanu. I, I think uh, Saurabh, if you, I, I think our uh, time is 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 up now. So unless, uh, yeah, I, I got your message. So we will we will wrap up now. So thank you very much, uh, Shantanu. Really appreciate. I think those were very insightful responses, very structured responses, uh, and and really appreciate your inputs and insights. I'm sure people who are listening must have got a lot of value from this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajiv. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and meet with you. And there's so much to learn from you. So right. thanks a lot. It was really thanks. nice interacting with you and uh, you know with all the audience uh, on this forum today. Thank you.